And you raised a set of fascinating issues, actually, and also highlighted important points of tension. But you've also highlighted uh, lots of opportunities at this point. So it's, of course, impossible to summarize everything that you've said, but I will just um, capture some of the key highlights and, and add a couple of issues that I thought is important also for us to look at as we're looking at the future and moving forward. So, so a, a key message that I heard clearly from both of you is that the current GFA is no longer fit for purpose. And there is a, a key importance for a new global financial architecture that's loud and clear. And there is also a common understanding of the dysfunctionalities. So maybe not invest more time in doing this analysis, but, but moving forward in terms of what kinds of solutions are we looking at and what kinds of new forms of financial architecture are we looking at uh, that's more equitable and that's more led by the global south. Um, I also heard um, uh, messages about multipolarity and the importance of the rising role of China as an alternative source of financing and South-South development cooperation, and also the importance of multipolar currency systems as well in the de-dollarization debate. Um, um, overall, we're seeing a new momentum around reimagining more equitable systems of economic governance. And uh, Rogerio has also uh, referred to the importance of not looking or stopping to look at the global north and looking at alternatives in the global south and institutions working together. Um, so these are, are some of the, the key highlights that I heard. Of course, the, the asymmetries and, and the power imbalance uh, since the, the start of the Bretton Woods institutions, but, but also the resistance for reform. And I think this is where we, we need to focus a little bit about, about this resistance for change and resistance for reforms. And as people and organizations and multi-stakeholders working in the field and trying to instigate change like what we did with the PLUS Fund, as a consortium of multi-stakeholders, um, where are, are we seeing the opportunities for change? And here I would like to lift up two, two issues. One is the issue of recentering the public good. I believe I've heard this from both of you, uh, but again, in, in, with such resistance, how do we capitalize on the current moment? and the multiple crises to center the notion of the public good. How do we shift the narrative? I think, Rogerio, you talked about the narrative and conservative narrative, you know, um, um, trying to maintain the, the status quo uh, for the interests of certain groups. So, so how do we shift this narrative from a, a, um, uh, a free market to global public investment, to uh, uh, the public good. And, and the second point is, is recentering politics in the economy as well. Like, how do we shift power? And particularly if we're trying to build up a bottom-up pressure for change, where do we see the openings? Where do we see the leverage points for engagement? And which global spaces should we target? So these are, are some of the questions that uh, I, I, I'm grappling with uh, in general, but also uh, having listened to both of you. And I just thought I would put them forward as we open the floor for the conversation uh, and also hear from, uh, from our participants. Um, so um, I suggest that we take two rounds of questions. So maybe start by three or four questions. Uh, uh, turn it back to Gilad and Rogerio for, for feedback, and then uh, start another round of questions uh, when, when possible. Um, yes, so uh, I already have a question uh, on, can the panelists please elaborate on fleshing out the global public good? Um, 
So can we take two more questions, please? And, and then let our, our panelists respond. Uh, people, please feel free to unmute and come in if you would like to, um, to speak and, and to put your question. Otherwise, put it in the chat, please. Ask a question. It's it's just a language issue that I <laughs> I'm not a native speaker of English. What what did uh, uh, Chi meant by flashing out global public good? Yeah, uh, my understanding of the question and and definitely see we can can add to this. But how do you unpack? How do you explain? the whole notion of the global public good in light of, of your uh, presentations. I mean, how would you center the, the issue of the global public good in, in this conversation? Yeah. Um, any other questions that we uh, have so far before turning it back to our um, panelists? OK, over to both of you. Mm -hmm. Well, Gila, would you like to go first? No, no, you can go. Up to well, the, if I if I understood the question, I and I think it's a very good question. I think let me let me tell you what, how I translated the question. Okay, uh, what are the the global challenges that you have? And and how can you address them? Something in, in that sense. Please, uh, if I'm pronouncing it right, Chi, uh, give a thumbs up if if that's the question that you want that you ask. Uh, excellent. Okay, I think that we have two major uh, global bads, and uh, that we have to address urgently. One which I continue to think is the root of all other. Uh, problems, uh, which is inequality. Uh, inequality, and, and it has always been, uh, in, you know, the problem is not just a moral issue. It's a, it's a, it's also, it, well, a moral issue, it should be enough to address it. But it's also a, an economic issue of the capacity of the system that we live to survive. I mean, you cannot, you, can, you cannot have a, a a long-term sustainable market economy or any economy if if you continue to to count on very few people to benefit from that. And it's a, a political and a geopolitical problem. And this is becoming uh, since the since the 2009 crisis, inequality has expanded so significantly. We're going backwards, and I think this is it has become a, a inequality emergency. The second one, which is related to that, is is climate change. Climate change, and I would it would take much longer for me to elaborate on this, but I think you have the, the feeling that you when you have a concentration of consumption on based on fossil fuels in a very small group of countries and people that overtake and use the energy that is driving us uh, to 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 the climate emergency, you can see how the two are related. So we need to reform, we have to think of changes in equality at the same time, uh, thinking about the transition uh, in energy, but also other types of, uh, of, of, uh, of consumptions that are not sustainable. So I think those are the two issues that we, we need to address. Now, having said that, let's go back to the discussion of, of uh, the reforms and I'll, I'll be very succinct here, I'm sorry, maybe too succinct. But I'm, I want to say, we, I think there is an opportunity for the South with their own institutions to promote a new narrative and project this narrative with actions. The first step that we have to, to take, and this is what I think we need to dedicate more time to understanding the Southern institutions, but also talking to the Southern institutions. Let's, let's look at the BRICS. Uh, uh, banks and the, the new arrangements, but also all, to, also all the arrangements, South-South arrangements of the world. We have to, instead of you know coming back over and over again, having a discussion of reform of the World Bank or the IMF, we should go to this institution and say, 
what can do we learn from the mistakes made in the previous arrangements? How can you, if for instance, China as again, can be a source of good in terms of share prosperity and monetary arrangements that are going to be stability and share prosperity, as I said, should be repeated. But they can go back into the same mistake. Look at the discussions of, of, of monetary arrangements. When the, we, we, the BRICS are talking about having a single uh, currency for trade and finance among them, having financial integration and so on. The Chinese are talking about having the yuan as the center of, of, of the universe, okay? This is a mistake 1.0, and we do not have time for mistakes. We don't have time for mistakes because inequality and a climate emergency are, are right in front of our, our faces, and, and this is leading to existential problems. So uh, bottom line, global goods and equality, uh, equality and reversing climate change. Second, how to address that through South-South cooperation. Third, most importantly, let's keep talking to our colleagues uh, in the South to say, do not repeat the same mistakes. So uh, sorry, I took too much time, but that, that's what I wanted to. Share with you. Thank you, Rogerio. Gilad, uh, anything to add here before we move yeah. to the second question? Yes. Thanks. And, and I'll respond also to some others that I've seen, if that's okay, Kara. Um, so I think that um, I'd like to start with Vishwas asked a question, which I think is quite pertinent. Um, I see that he's left, uh, uh, unfortunately. But he, he the end part of, of his question is what what makes change possible now and what's different today and i think that's that's something which we've spoken about with 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 our collective yes the global financial architecture has been inequitable in some of the same ways in some other ways too um in for the last 40 years and some of the same things which we're saying now have been said previously right so what's different um, and what can we do which is different also and i don't like uh, that's a question which i really think we collectively with within the this the world those of us in, engaged on this issue need to come together and speak about i think that the conjuncture and, and this builds on points which have just been made so i won't go into them again by the other by you guys but the conjuncture is different one difference is multipolarity um you you had a uh, you didn't have uh, other meaningful poles of global financial influence for the last 30 years um uh the sort of extreme nature of, of of these crises now um the existential issue of a climate crisis and the, 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 this is not separate climate finance is an integral piece of the global financial arch the architecture and if we're going to get get climate solutions right we have to get climate finance right and if we need to get climate finance right, that's only possible within a reformed global financial architecture. So the climate crisis calls on us um, in that way. And then I think it is important for us to look for uh, alignments between global north and south um, actors within our countries, labor, movements um, and and so on and the manner in which the global financial ar ar architecture disadvantages global north uh, uh, non elites is is also a very important point of of convergence um just to note that in the uh, on a global public good there's also a narrower way in which that term is used which is an actual good which is used globally and the US dollar is sometimes referred to or that there should be a currency serving the purpose of a global public good. Um, that's also how that term 
is, is used. Uh, Veronica asked a really useful question and, and people can look in the Q&A about that, which is whether the new layers uh, in the architecture occurred as a result of, of COVID. Um, my response is that I'm not sure that the, it called forth, you know, um, uh, novel instruments, but it did result in certain things being implemented, okay, uh, including rapid financing, um, uh, including the SDRs being used for, uh, linked to a social need, and including a reformulating of, of uh, policy approaches in global North countries, the kind of stimuluses which we saw have broken with economic orthodoxies. Of course, what we've also seen is a re-entrenchment of those orthodoxies in austerity and in global South countries. But the global North uh, you know, has quite profoundly broken with certain uh, uh, dominant uh, conservative logics. Um, and so there are, there are opportunities, I think, which, which that uh, raises. Um, there was, sorry, I just, so I don't have to come in again. There were, uh, then there was one last question on de-dollarization um, and, and if there's an enabling environment and what this means. You know, it's, it's highly contentious. There's different camps, which the one camp says, you know, it's often linked to kind of Harvard economists and so on, says that the overwhelming uh, uh, majority of payments um, still take place in dollars and that there are structural features uh, uh, which make de-dollarization unlikely, okay, for... Um, uh, for instance, uh, the availability and stability of, a, of an alternative, okay, right? Um, I think on the counter to that, this is playing out in real time where, where this is actually being used. And his, his, historically, there's no permanence to, uh, to like global currency. Um, uh, and so, yeah, I, I would say for our purposes, it's certainly a thread which we need to push on, but to, but to do so uh, 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 cautiously um, uh, and uh, or deliberately in in terms of what we would want to uh, set up um, uh, um, uh, as an alternative, as has 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 already been uh, alluded to. Thank you, Gilad and, and Rogerio. And, and um, just uh, again, a follow-up question, because as we're talking about the rising momentum, we're seeing some opportunities. Some people were asking what makes this a unique moment. Again, as, as practitioners, as multi-stakeholders, as activists, where are the, the spaces, and I'm referring here to your experience in the PLUS Fund as well as a consortium, where are you seeing the entry points and the leverage points? And which global spaces uh, people need to be engaging in now as opposed to the, the spring meetings of the World Bank and the IMF, and as Dr. Rogerio reminded us, you know, shift away from, from the the traditional and usual conversations. So what kind of, of shifts are, are we talking about and how are we building this bottom-up pressure, which I believe is very, very important for the next phase? Yeah. Um, Gada, I think the, I mean, it's a really crucial question. And I, I, you know, I, I agree that there is some well-worn types of proposals and advocacy, which I don't think we should stop making, for instance, the reform of IFI governance, okay? But which we should also know what else we, we, we can do and what the limitations of those are. I see two important 
spaces. Um, the first, uh, which uh, uh, Rogerio has already mentioned, is in uh, in Global South spaces, such as the New Development Bank uh, in BRICS and, and in so on. Now, the, it's complicated because some of these spaces are dominated by regimes which also have dubious elements, whether that's Russia, which is dubious in, in many ways, or, you know, sort of China's autocratic elements and so on. So there's no angels in this process. Brazil obviously is a much more progressive um, uh, uh, actor. Um, but, uh, you know, if you look, for instance, and, uh, you know, Rogerio is, is, a, is, is more of an expert on this than, than I am, but if you look at the manner in which the new development bank is acting, there are question marks, but uh, in share ownership or, or, and therefore in voice, in speed of, of lending, in decisions not to have policy uh, conditionalities and in decisions to lend um, not only in US dollars, but in local currency, you know, all of those shake up the existing trends within multilateral uh, 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 the development finance institutions like the World Bank. And, and we, I think, need to uphold those and cement the positive elements while still, you know, there's still oversight, gender, environmental concerns around certain lending practices and, and, and so on. But certainly in Global South, uh, uh, forums. Um, I do think, though, there are multilateral forums, which are also very important outside of the um, sort of uh, Bretton Woods institutions. And the, the UN global tax uh, impetus, I think, is an example of how a multilateral forum like the UN, with, with all of its limitations and slow, uh, you know, and uh, uh, bureaucracy and, 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 and so on, is a much more democratic space than the sort of OECD, G7, uh, uh, Bretton Woods institutions, um, and, and so on. Um, we need that in particular in climate financing, a very worrying trend which South Africa's jet P, this uh, climate financing illustrates, is, is, is a bilateral approach where a consortium of, of, of global North donors uh, engage with a global South country. Now that's going to recreate the same problem. So there are UN and other climate financing, uh, not conventions, but standards, norms, a lot of which are being ignored. But we need to cement, for instance, a real multilateral climate finance um, uh, institution. So both on the level of Global South entry points, but there are you know, important entry points um, on a multilateral uh, level. I'm unconvinced that the Bretton Woods institutions are reformable in the ways that we would like. But of course, that's not a fight. I think we should stop fighting. Thank you, Gilad. I, I would like to um, turn it back to Dr. Rogerio here for um, responding to uh, David's question. I, I guess you, you can see the question, Dr. Rogerio. Yeah, uh, let me see, uh, David, we have a uh, lending to countries. Yeah, that's a, a interesting, uh, all questions have been interesting and uh, comments made by, by, by Ajila too. Uh, see, this is the, the problem, the, what we have seen in the recent history is this. I mean, 
changes are made in the, the way these institutions operate when there's a crisis that knocks at the doors of the G7 and so on. And of course, there's one there's one crisis that is is the, the inequality was knocking at the doors slightly. There was a moral issue about that. Oh yeah, there's some uh, the people poor people around that. When it becomes a geopolitical question, then it's got banging at the door and say, hey, uh, it becomes very loud. Uh, a pandemic when you had a global health issue is something that is knocking at, uh, very heavily at, at all the doors. Climate change is not yet there, uh, but it's getting there very quickly. Uh, and uh, I think that the South already knows all, all this global, the global goods or global issues already in, inside the houses of, the, of those in the North. Uh, they see that every day. They open the window and see it. They see in pollution, they see in droughts, they see in fires, they see in people, people not having access to water, Sanitation, uh, girls not being able uh, uh, to to study because of, of of not having access to 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 proper infrastructure. Name it; they they're all being there. So I think that unfortunately, if we wait for the reforms of the Bretton Woods institutions, uh, we will have to wait for a great a bang at the door, something really big, a tragedy. And it's a, there's some of them already happening, but happening inside those countries to make them wake up. I don't think we, we should, we should not wish for it. We should not wait for that. Uh, 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 and uh, uh, the idea that you know, there will be a reform and that for the reform we provide more for climate finance. Climate finance nowadays is a, just a drop of water in terms of the mobilization of resources that you need to address inequality and climate uh, uh, events in, in developing countries. What we need to realize is that there's enormous capacity to mobilize resources within the South, within the South. I'm not talking about you know, the big emerging markets, but even in smaller ones, and that we have to unleash that capacity somehow on the fiscal side, for instance, but also tapping the, re the resources available in, 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 in the South and country. But that's a longer conversation. What I am, the point that I'm trying to make here is that I open the newspaper and I open the journals. I can read 1,000 uh, 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 articles and reports about how, what, how uh, the World Bank and the IMF have changed. If I read one about the New Development Bank or the Asian Infrastructure Investment Bank or other development banks, national banks, it's, I'm going to be thrilled. We need and when and and I don't I I ask you how many articles have you been reading about uh, triangular cooperations within southern development banks uh, or the uh, arrangements in the south? Very in the proportions minimal. Mm -hmm. We are looking at the wrong place, and we having the conversations with the wrong people. We should be talking to the, 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 those, for instance, the NDB, saying you have to widen the membership. You have to look at the mistakes that, that the World Bank has done in the past and not reproduce their mistakes. You have to collaborate. You have to have a business models that collaborate with Southern uh, banks in a completely different way from the, the way the World Bank and other Western banks. This is the kind of conversation. To be very frank with you, and I'll, I'll stop here, we are talking with the wrong uh, actors. Not that we don't have to talk with the World Bank. We should. We should expect even that talking among us more uh, will lead the World Bank to change even faster. Because otherwise, if you look at the proposals for the reform of the World Bank, this is more of the same thing. And now trying to use the World Bank to in, in, uh, do more climate finance that the G7 uh, is not doing. They're not putting enough money in climate change, which is minimal, $100 billion. And now we say, oh, the World Bank will do it. We're going to reform it. No, we have to, to take talk to the right actors. We have to do more studies and talk among ourselves about how those actors can collaborate. We have to rethink the international financial sector from south to north, but particularly 
starting with uh, the conversation itself. Sorry, I could go on on all this. I got a little bit excited about this conversation and I, I, I hope I didn't take too much time. Thank you, thank you so much. We basically have one minute. So, so we had one, one more question, but if, if one of you can- I apologize for brief. that. <laughs> I know I that's too okay. Much time. If, if Gilad, you can be very brief. The question is, is about, and before we wrap up is about the prospects for civil society. Like where are we seeing the openings? Where are we seeing the closures? Particularly in light of the closure of the civic space and the various threats that we're seeing to uh, happening to human rights defenders and uh, working on issues of climate, but also working on other issues. So if you can do this in one minute and we wrap up, that would be great. Thank you. You all got it in a minute. Um, I'll just <laughs> say one thing then, which is to say that I think there are there's there's a huge sense of alliance building, which I feel a lot of organizations across countries um, and across org organizational spheres and across silos, which are engaging with one another. Uh, and I think that's one example of a positive um, opening um, at the at the moment, the, as well as an engagement with a conceptual framework, for instance, a rights-based approach, um, uh, but uh, it, it, in trying to form collectively what it means to advance um, alternatives. Uh, there are other answers to that, but in a minute. I'm sure. Thank you. Thank you so much for our panelists, for SCIS, and for our very active participants. And, and thanks for a very engaged conversation. Thank you so much. 